Please welcome to the stage MIT Associate Professor Carrie Cahoy. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. I'm excited to be here today to talk about revolutionary nanosatellite technology. On this slide, you'll see two CubeSats nanosatellites. They're five kilograms each. On the left, we have a weather sensor that's used to sense tropical storms and hurricanes on a mission called Tropics. And on the right is a MIT student-built laser communications satellite that is to help get data from orbit on these tiny platforms down to the ground. It is called CLIC. It's part of a three-satellite mission, CLIC A, B, and C. This is CLIC A. So I'm excited to talk to you about more of them. So these nanosatellites have some really important advantages. Um, they don't have to be only on the rocket by themselves. So they let you do ride shares. So you can have multiple spacecraft on a rocket, and you can get up to space in a couple different ways. Um, one way is kind of like packing your bags and going to the airport. <laughs> you go up as cargo to the International Space Station, where the astronauts will unpack you, put you on a robotic arm, and then, just like shown in the slide here, eject you into orbit. These are two MIT satellites. The one I'm talking today is the LaserCom one, click A. Also, hot off the press or hot off the launch pad, this past month we've seen two um, MIT Lincoln and MIT student developed missions for weather sensors. This is the Tropics mission. They are launching on a new small satellite launch rocket called the Rocket Lab Electron from New Zealand. Two of them went up on May 7th, and then another two went up on May 25th. I'm going to talk a little bit about what those missions are doing and um, some of the previous precursor successes that we've had on the ex experiments leading up to those. So first, the Tropics mission. This is a nanosatellite mission that is to help us do a better job of mapping where hurricanes and tropical storms go. Um, it's very difficult to be able to track these because the satellites that we have, the weather satellites that we have on orbit right now, revisit the same spot not even every day, sometimes every couple days, sometimes every few days. What we can do when we have more smaller satellites is put them into orbits with more of them up so we can get revisits rates as low as only an hour. So when we have situations like this, where this is an example of Hurricane Ida, um, we can actually be able to improve this cone of uncertainty from where the hurricane is. Um, so this is the predicted path, which is pretty wide, and it's hard to allocate resources and get the resources we need both for prevention and for recovery. But if we knew the actual track, which is this line, better, we could do a better job of that. So um, these missions let us do that by sensing um, with radio, radio frequency antennas. They sense the emission from atoms and molecules in the atmosphere. They're vibrating, and they give off these emission signals. And you can measure them just like on a radio station, kind of tuned to different channels. Um, these antennas listen to different channels of radio frequency energy, and each channel lets us see a different height in the atmosphere. So this is an example of one of the channels from some of our on-orbit data. This is Hurricane Ida coming in. This is before landfall, and this is in after landfall. And this is looking at one of the channels that does a really good job of picking up precipitation, scattering off of precipitation. And you can see that before landfall, these are the rain bands, and after landfall, these are where the rain bands are. So you can use this data to feed into our numerical weather forecasting software, which is only as good as the data that go into it, um, to improve the storm tracks and the predictions. It's really important as things get more intense. And to just give a sense of how small these are compared to the other satellites that don't have as many revisits, this is a the kind of state-of-the-art weather satellite, SWOMI NPP. This is a human in a bunny suit down um, on the lab floor here working with it. This is 2,100 kilograms. For comparison, this is the nano satellite. It's five kilograms, and this is kind of to scale, so it's about as long as your arm. Um, so this is very exciting work. Um, however, one of the hard parts about these nano satellites is getting data from them to the ground. They don't have any big antennas on them. They don't have any huge batteries. They don't have huge solar panels to get that data down. And even if they did, the um, radio frequency spectrum for getting data from space 
to Earth is really congested. It's really contentious, and it's difficult to get licenses for those. Um, so what we are doing here at MIT, and this year our students have developed a way to use essentially just like this laser pointer from space to blink it kind of on and off to get data down to low cost ground telescopes um, literally on campus. So we built a satellite called Click A that I'm gonna talk about. That was the one deploying from the space station and it connected to an amateur astronomy class telescope that you can literally buy on Amazon with, it souped up a little bit. Um, and we had a successful data link to the telescope that I'll show you about. And our next step is gonna do a cross link between terminals on orbit and that's coming up next year. So um, this is the ground station. It doesn't look like you would expect. So literally during the pandemic, everybody was building sheds in their backyard. We built a shed too. So this is at um, Wallace Observatory in Westford and at the roof on it kind of slides over to the side. And this is where we have the, you know, 28 centimeter amateur astronomy Celestron telescope that has some extra, you know, extra accessories for tracking and being able to track the satellite. Um, and this is kind of a comparison of the state-of-the-art facility. So this is an amazing facility where they do an amazing amount of work with deep space laser comm missions, but it's much bigger. So this is a telescope at Table Mountain in California, and this is kind of the comparison to the inside of the shed. We have a lot of racks of equipment, a lot of um, optical elements, a lot of um, adaptive optics. So this is uh, the data that we took in November, just when it was getting cold. We need to plan it for summer next time. Um, but this is light from that little satellite coming to the telescope at Westford, and this is showing that it does it with pointing error that's well low enough to meet our goal line to be able to communicate at you know, 10 megabit per second data rates to the satellite. So we're very excited about this work. Um, so um, just moving towards future forecasting, um, a lot of exciting things are happening in the space domain. We are moving towards more of a space internet. I think we'll start to see analysis happening more on orbit, so all the data that these satellites are taking, we do have a struggle right now to get them down to the ground and analyzed. I think with AI, with onboard computing and processing improving, and better resources being made on satellites, we'll start to see these data being exchanged above the clouds um, and being able to instead network and develop a space in internet where we're starting to do more of this analysis on orbit and our results of the inferences, the lower data rate things are what we'll need to send to the ground. So we'll be able to pass data around, do the inferences analysis on orbit and then have a reduced data volume to the ground with more nodes on orbit doing more persistent constant imaging and getting better data. So this is all very exciting and we're trying to build the technologies to make that possible. MIT is really excited about leading the way in this area. Um, we have a new small satellite collaborative that brings together multiple departments on campus, a lot of our affiliates um, along with us. Um, and so we're going to innovate and lead the way. And I don't know if you noticed, I hope you noticed, um, on top of building 54 this year as you visit campus, we have managed to refurbish the radome thanks to ARDC and other sponsors. So we have a new um, radome up on building 54 for the five meter dish up there that we are going to use for both amateur radio activities as well as small satellite mission and communication. So it's all very exciting and I'm happy to talk more about it um, and, and help you know, get everyone connected and involved. So thank you so much and um, appreciate the time.